Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to the latest instalment of Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. So, today I'm going to be talking about two different books. I'm going to be talking about Indisputably Doris by Charles Heathcote and Fortune Box by Madeline Swan. And uh, both of these authors are also on Booktube slash Authortube. They both do a bit of both, really. And so, yeah, you should check out their channels. I'm going to talk to you about these books and then I'm going to let you know what I will be reading next month. In fact, let me tell you what I'm going to read next month now. Alright, so as I've read two this month, I'm going to try and read two next month as well, but then we'll probably be back to one. I am currently, I'm not sure which, because I want to try and do booktube as you see, but I'm not sure which booktuber slash authortuber to pick next, so if you have any recommendations for you know, authors on booktube that you love, then let me know and I will check them out. In the meantime, next month I'm going to read The Road to Rangoon by Lucy Crookshanks. So this is Lucy from Book Axe. This is actually her second book. It's the sequel to The Trader of Saigon. But technically, this is an indie because it's published by Heron, which is a Quirkus imprint. And so, uh, to balance that, I am going to read a true indie novel, which is Bad Sandwich by Ollie Jacobs, and he is a local author from here in High Wycombe, so he's not on booktube. We have one booktuber and one true indie book. To be fair, Lucy still needs the support, you know, it's not like because she's on printed by Heron Books that she gets millions of sales all of a sudden. So uh, yeah, I'm going to read those two next month. In the meantime, for this month, let's take a look at Indisputably Doris by Charles Heathcote. So uh, this is my signed copy as well. I had uh, this was actually a swap. So I bought a copy of our Doris, and then I swapped my, a copy of Driven, which is my book, with Charlie for Indisputably Doris. And actually, Charlie reviewed Driven on his channel, so I'll link to that below. Now I'll also link to my review of our Doris actually, because as you'll know if you've seen that, I really enjoyed the first book. I actually put it in my top ten books of the quarter, and. I think this might be in my top 10 books of this quarter as well. If anything, I actually preferred this to the first book. So I'm going to read you the blurb. Indisputably, Doris is the second book in a series of monologues featuring Mrs. Doris Copeland of Partridge Muse, atomic housewife and owner of a rock bun recipe that can make the most secure dentures shudder. Join her once more as she battles Pandora O'Malley for her position as chairwoman of the WI. Her campaign brings her up against flu, would-be elves, and a bake sale that may just be a cover for more nefarious means. Told from the perspective of her long-suffering husband, Harold, it's no wonder he spends so much time down the hare and horse. So this is a humorous book. It's very much in the vein of kind of British comedies, kind of slightly older British comedies, like Keeping Up Appearances. It reminds me, like, Hello, Hello as well. It's got that sense of humour, if not the setting. I mean, this isn't set in... France during the war so that may have been a bad comparison but but if you enjoy those shows and stuff like Only Fools and Horses even it's more of a northern sense of humor as opposed to Only Fools and Horses which was very much Cockney humor but if you like that kind of classic British sense of humor you're gonna love this book and it has lots of references as well to British sitcoms and uh, soap operas as well so we have here as well this is something you're either gonna totally get the message or you're, it's gonna go straight over your head and you're probably only going to get this one if you're British, but still. Um, so Doris goes to work at this charity shop. Because she wants to be the manager of the Women's Institute, she has to go and volunteer for charity. So uh, this is Harold, obviously, narrating. He says, Well, we were sat across from the manager of the charity shop. She's a string bean of a woman. Looks like she hasn't seen a slice of good bread since the 80s. And she had those big glasses so that she looked like a cross between Deirdre Barlow and Eli from Last of the Summer Wine. I like this as well. So, so uh, Doris gives this woman some advice. And uh, this woman goes, that wasn't advice. It was plain offensive. And our Doris straightened her spine near, shoulders back, and I knew she were going in for the killer. She said to Evie, she said, People are so easily offended nowadays. As a white, heterosexual female living in the 21st century, I'm quite aware of the trials and tribulations faced by those the world over. I have an acid tongue, and it is this talent that has helped me reach my position as interim chairwoman of the WI. Sometimes my advice may seem offensive, but it is the truth. And the truth is that those glasses wouldn't suit Kate Middleton, let alone the manager of a provincial charity shop. Which I thought was excellent. I think that really affects our uh, times. I, I used the term snowflake generation in one of my previous videos, and people thought that was funny. So we'll say that. I mean, I am a member of this generation as well. 
But uh, yes, people are easily offended nowadays. I love this. So, so Doris has been baking for this WI thing and Harold goes into the kitchen and he says, well, when I walked in, the kitchen no longer looked like a kitchen. A celiac could have walked in and been dead in seconds. Every surface, the table, the counter, the side cabinet, they were all coated in a layer of self-raising flour. It was as though there'd been an explosion at Mr. Kipling's, fingerprints all over the show, and I had no idea what to say. I like explosion at Mr. Kipling's. I also like the celiac joke as well. You see, I could be really offended by that because my dad has celiac disease, so therefore I now have a right to call Charlie a bell end or something. I like this as well where Harold says, uh, I said to him, I said, if I were to die before one of our Doris's do, she'd kill me. She'd put me on life support just so she could pull the plug. I like this as well. Harold, Harold talks about his dad here. He says, Copeland men are notorious for responding poorly when shocked. My dad once thumped a DJ when he played Mambo number no. five instead of that Samore. Bear in mind Harold's in his 70s here as well. So his dad was probably in his 70s to, to 80s maybe when he thumped that DJ. I think it is, it's, it's all of the comparisons and the metaphors and the similes that I really enjoy from this book. So let me read you this one. This is another one that you won't get unless you watch Coronation Street, but... Our Doris was seething. She were more gobsmacked than when Deirdre Barlow had a fling with Mike Baldwin. Her fists were clenched that tight, Mike Tyson wouldn't stand around with her. And to, to put that into context as well, this is like almost, these, re these references are kind of retro. This is all stuff that happened in like my childhood and presumably Charlie's childhood. So for example, hey Google, when did Mike Baldwin die? According to Wikipedia, six. John Ernest Briggs, MBE, born the 5th of September 1935, is an English actor. He is best known for his role as Mike Baldwin in the soap opera Coronation Street, in which he appeared from 1976 to 2006 and again in 2012 in the text Santa special as a ghost. <laughs> of course he came back as a ghost, I'd forgotten about that. So yeah, Mike Baldwin died in the soap, I guess in 2006. So Deirdre had her affair with him before that. I miss Mike Baldwin, he was good. I like this description of Theo as well. So Theo is one of the younger characters. Uh, he's at school, he says. So I said to her, I said, where's Theo? He'd agree with me. It's midday in the middle of the summer holidays. Where do you think he is? In bed. He stays up till three in the morning and sleeps through the day. It's like living with a flatulent vampire. I like this bit as well where, so Harold's like, Harold's got this mate who's a bit of a drunk uh, called Alf. And basically he comes over and they get drunk and then they end up just falling asleep in the same bed. We'd emptied the bottle and a few hours down the line I awoke to the shrill cry of our Doris as she screamed, Harold, what's he doing in our bed? I looked over to see Alf in bed with me. He snored that loud that I hadn't been able to tell the difference between my best mate and my wife. Our Doris caught sight of the empty bottle and said, she said, You could have done the decent thing and been a homosexual, but no, you had to be a drunk. Wake him up and get him into the spare room. I can't send him back to Edith in this state. Good old Doris. A great quote when somebody says to Doris, she, uh, I, don't, I can't remember who it is, but it's not important. They say, green tea? I tell you, have you ever met a drinker of green tea who wasn't around the twist? I agree with that. <laughs> anyway, I think that's all I'm going to say about Indisputably Doris. It's rating time. I gave this one a 4.5 out of 5, maybe a 5 out of 5 at a push. I don't know, we'll see in editing. And like I say, I think it's probably gonna be one of my favorite books of the quarter. I really did enjoy it, possibly more so than the first. And I wanna read book three, but that's not what Charlie's working on at the moment. So I have to wait. Grr. All right, next up we have Fortune Box by Madeline Swan. So I'll read you the blurb of this one. No one knows where or what Tower Limited Surprise Packages is or why it's sending gifts to complete strangers across the city. All they know is that each package is the best thing that's ever happened to them, or the worst. In one box is a packet of seeds that allows you to grow your perfect date. In another, there's a cupcake that causes anyone who eats it to grow eyeballs all over the skin. There's also a parcel with a mouse trap that turns all your enemies tiny. Or you could your receipt, or you could receive your autobiography, which, when signed, makes your every thought famous. Or maybe even a key to a secret door that leads to another dimension where all your unfurnished and abandoned projects exist. But with each package but with each package received comes both fortune and misfortune that will surely result in unexpected consequences. Like a season of episodes from the Twilight Zone or Friday the 13th, the series, comes a collection of dark and humorous stories from the premier British female author of bizarro fiction. So like I said, Madeleine Swan is also on YouTube and you can check her out there. And all right, my thoughts on this. Well, 
I enjoyed it as a whole. I enjoyed like I quite like the overall arch that tied all of the different stories together. This kind of theme of all the packages being received, and obviously with any short story collection, which I guess you would call this is kind of a short story collection. But again, it all ties together. But with any collection, you're going to enjoy some stories more than others, and that was the case here. I think overall, I did really enjoy the ideas that were used and the way they were kind of written into the stories. I did have a few problems though, but I could get over them, you know what I mean? So there were occasional typos, I think maybe two or three in the whole thing and they were minor ones. My main thing was actually her speech tags, her dialogue tags. So uh, I'll find you some examples. It says, for example, okay, Mira reached for her bag, I'm going home. Where it should be, okay, Mira said, reaching for her bag. Or okay, full stop, Mira reached for her bag, I'm going home. So there's a lot of examples throughout and I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but personally for me it just kind of annoyed me. For example, no, I really need help, Green Goose splashed onto the aisle. I need help, Seedman bent double. Here's an example of one of the minor typos, so it says its ears were very similar to a rabbit's, but it doesn't have an apostrophe in rabbits where it should do. That's actually the only one I can find though, and so... I can't, I can't remember what all the things I tabbed out were, like what they were for in this, in this book. So there are lots of pages that I tabbed, but actually I can't, like I've just reread the pages and I'm like, what did I mean to say about this? I don't remember. But uh, all in all, it was pretty good. Uh, it, you know, again, it was hampered a bit by those, uh, the dialogue tags. But again, after I got about halfway through, I kind of stopped noticing them. The ideas were pretty good in it though. I mean, for an indie release, it's at worst it's fine you know so uh, rating time I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5 I rounded it up to 4 for Goodreads and Amazon and it's definitely quirky and if you check out Madeline's channel and you like the style of her videos you can you can very much tell it's come from her you know what I mean she's definitely sort of put her voice into it which I think is good there we have it and on that note thanks a lot for watching don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any indie books in the last month and if so what they were hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more and i'll see you soon for another video thanks a lot Bye bye